If you're on a salary in Australia and you've been thinking about buying your very first electric car, the thing that's probably held you back to this point is the staggering cost of EV ownership when you compare it to a more conventional car. New legislation which passed through the Parliament on Monday is set to radically reduce the cost of EV ownership and remove this barrier to acquisition, potentially for you. So if you've been sitting on this fence, maybe it's time to go a bit Humpty Dumpty. In this report, I'm going to show you exactly the recipe for Australia's cheapest electric car omelette. I'm John Logan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars at cheap Australia only website card formalities out of the way. Let's talk legislation. Now, I normally don't jump out of bed and go, <laughs> legislation, let's go. But in this case, it is actually pretty exciting, okay? The Albo government managed to pass a thing called the Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill 2022 on Monday through both houses. So it's legislation now, and it's also backdated to the 1st of July, in case you were interested. According to the government, quote, the bill exempts certain electric vehicles from fringe benefits tax. For eligible vehicles, this will result in a significant cost reduction. So let's talk about that. What are these eligible vehicles and which ones are subjected to fringe benefits tax? And how can you leverage this to get the EV that you've been fantasising about at a, quote, significant cost reduction? So it's for battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids under about 85,000 bucks. It's actually $84,916, which is the luxury car tax threshold for fuel efficient vehicles in Australia. And the reason it's such a dodgy, seemingly not round number is because it's indexed every quarter or every year, whatever. Anyway, it goes up by whatever the inflation rate is, okay? And uh, therefore, it's never a round number. But if you just bookmark in your head that the vehicles have to be under just shy of 85 grand for them to be amenable to this new legislation, then you're in the ballpark, dude. Okay, so, and it has to be under a salary sacrifice or novated leasing arrangement. They're the same thing. Salary sacrifice, novated leasing, because that's where the fringe benefits tax imposition takes place. All right? And that's not as hard as it sounds, okay? It's not as complex as it sounds. If you're on a salary, you are pretty much eligible for a novated lease or a salary sacrifice car. You've got to line up a financier and your employer and everyone has to buy in, but nothing else really needs to line up for you to get this sort of arrangement up and running. You don't have to use the car at all for business use. This can be 100% private use, like, and you still get the tax benefit, which is kind of unheard of, right? So the way I read the legislation, it represents sort of up to a $6,000 windfall if you're the right person. And it essentially means that a car like a rear-wheel drive Tesla Model 3 is going to be about the same price as a Corolla SX Hybrid the same price in the context of the impost on your take-home pay, like the reduction in your take-home pay in exchange for one of those two cars, okay? Let's not forget, though, that the Model 3 is, like, just shy of 70 grand, whereas the SX Corolla Hybrid is, like, 37, something like that. So this is a way of stimulating mainstream EV acquisition, and if you're the right person... It's a no-brainer. Now, for expensive EVs over that quasi $85,000 threshold, the standard fringe benefits tax imposition is going to pertain. So the government's not really backhanding the rich too hard here because if you're going to buy a $100,000 EV, you're going to pay the full whack of FBT. That's still going to be happening. But if you want one of these more affordable EVs, then it just got a whole lot more affordable. And I ran the numbers on this with some dudes I know at novatedleaseaustralia.com.au. And before you type that into Google, I'll just save your fingertips. 
just type in nla.com.au. And I dealt with them because I know the dude who owns that particular shop. And he's actually the dude who got me into the whole new cars <laughs> business. And here we are. So I've known him for well over a decade. And I know plenty of the consultants over there as well. And they are absolutely on the money. And I feel completely confident reporting to you the numbers that they quoted me on this because I trust them and I know who they are, right? Now, the vehicle packaging schedules that they produced for me, I'll make them available to you. You can look at them up on the screen now, okay? The Model 3 and the Corolla that I just talked about. And this whole scenario is based on an $80,000 salary for dudes and dudettes like you, and 20,000 kilometres of annual driving. So you don't have to be the chief operating officer of the company. You can just be an ordinary employee, and you can see how this plays out. It's actually $208 a week for out of your take-home pay for the Tesla, and 209 for the Corolla. So technically less for the Tesla, but dollar a week. Let's call it the same, okay? And let's focus on the difference in the price because it's 68,000 bucks for the Tesla and 38,000 or something for the Corolla hybrid, right? This is the SX hybrid. The FEVs, okay, if you want to plug in hybrid, that part of the deal is going to be phased out in 2025 because the government had to do a deal with the Greens and also a Senator, David Pocock, Okay, to get this legislation across the line. And they both wanted to put less pressure on internal combustion or more pressure, whichever way you want to look at it. They want to phase out the internal combustion part of transportation more rapidly. And therefore, this concession to plug-in hybrids is only going to be available until 2025. But foreseeably, the stimulus for electric cars is going to be indefinite into the future, at least until some other person in the government turns this legislative instrument around, okay? Now, if you've got a salary of just under 100K, the way I see this, an internal combustion engine only vehicle for about 74,000 bucks, the benefit to you is going to be sort of $3,800 under a novated lease. And we'll get into what a novated lease is in just a minute if you're slightly hazy on that. But if you want to buy a conventional car with a novated lease, you're on 100K and the vehicle costs 74, then the benefit to you from novated leasing, salary sacrificing, is about $3,800. If you want to do exactly the same thing with a battery EV or a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, the benefit to you is more like $9,800. So that's a massive inversion of the status quo. $6,000 different. You know, you're buying a car for the same value. People tend to define themselves by how much they're willing to sacrifice out of their salary and see their take-home pay drop. So is a much bigger benefit to you if you buy the battery EV or the plug-in hybrid EV with a salary sacrifice now. And it's really important to realise this. Otherwise, if you just sign across on the dotted line now without really being aware of the nuts and bolts of this legislation, you could be doing yourself a massive disservice. And I know if you contact them, the dudes at novatedleaseaustralia.com.au will be happy to run the numbers for internal combustion and battery EV for you at your particular price point and salary, and you can see exactly where you are going to stand either way, right? But the difference, 6000 bucks, is kind of not something you see governments handing out all the time, especially for private vehicles, you know, vehicles that don't do any business use. It's a massive potential saving, right? So if you're on a lower salary, like say $60,000, and you want to buy a BYD Atto 3, the take-home pay reduction, the difference in the take-home pay that you get now and the take-home pay that you will get with an Atto 3 in the driveway, 157 bucks a week. That's a massive backhander from the government. 
If you're on an $80,000 salary with a Model 3 in mind, like the rear-wheel drive Model 3 we just talked about, the difference in your take-home pay between no car in the driveway and Model 3 in the driveway, 208 bucks a week, and it's going to cost you the same to put a hybrid Corolla in the driveway, and what would you rather see in the driveway? Okay? And these are both examples that are based on a five-year lease and 20,000 kilometres per year. Okay, just for complete disambiguation on that. And if you want a boxed sort of set of vehicles that this situation applies to, the fringe benefits tax exemption, they include the BYD Auto 3, the Tesla Model 3 we just talked about. Incidentally, with the Auto 3, it includes the extended range version. It's under the price threshold. The MG ZS EV is there. The Leaf, including the E+, Plus, the Kona Electric's in there, the Mini Cooper EV, and the Polestar 2. So it's not like there's a choice of one or two cars. It's like a bunch and you can choose the one that you like the look of the best or whatever other protocols you want to put in place to choose the car there's plenty to choose from is what I'm saying okay what I'd also suggest is that novated leasing can be a little bit line ball for some employees conventional novated leasing all right sometimes it's an advantage and sometimes it can cost you more right? That's by virtue of a range of factors, the number of Ks you drive, your salary, the particular leasing package that you get offered, and there's a lot of variability there. But with this new arrangement, it's a lay down misere. It's like very hard for me to see a situation where a mainstream EV can be had more cheaply any other way, including redrawing your own mortgage or just paying cash for it, you know, like just getting the money out of the bank and paying for it. When you look at the all-up cost, it's much cheaper. And the, the question is not, is Novated Leasing right for me in this situation? It's like, how much am I going to save over the alternative methods of acquisition, right? But I would say, you know, I'm not being an advocate for the Novated Leasing industry here, it is a little bit of the wild, wild west out there, and I'd say employers do tend to get a little bit lazy from time to time as well. What they do often is they lock themselves into one, two, or three different providers, and those providers, once they get given the keys to the employee payroll, if you like, they do tend to ramp up their costs and the deal that you can be offered in these situations, because there's not really a free market economy in play then, the deal can be poor. So it's always a good idea to do a health check on the Novated Lease deal that you do get offered, especially if your employer locks you into one, two or three providers. And I know the dudes at nla.com.au would be happy to health check your particular Novated Lease as well. They're the one that you're about to sign off on. So if you want to see if it's a ripoff or not, that's a pretty good way of doing it, just saying. Okay, so... If you're a bit hazy on Novated Leasing, what it is, it's really just a bit of a three-way type agreement between you, the employee, and your employer over here and a finance company. And each of you has a different role in this deal. You have to agree to make the payments out of your pre-tax salary. So that's a deduction that comes out of your pay, all right? And it's your problem, okay? You you enter into this agreement. The lease comes with you if you leave the company. You've got to go into that with your eyes open, all right? But the beauty of doing it this way is that it reduces your taxable income and some of the money that you would have otherwise paid in tax actually gets translated into a tangible benefit, the car, in your driveway. Now, novated leases and salary sacrifices... They, the two terms are used interchangeably and they're exactly the same thing. And they're also called salary packaging. The packaging part of this is because you can put other things in the package. Like it's not just the car, right? You can also put in the rego, the comprehensive insurance, the servicing. All of the costs basically can be put into the package and paid for with the one deduction out of your pre-tax salary. So that's a pretty good deal for some people. You want to get independent. If you're unsure, you want to get independent advice on this. Don't take my word for it. I don't want to be your de facto financial advisor. And 
I'm not a financial advisor and I'd need to know more about your situation anyway just to get you in the ballpark, right? But the benefits of Novated Leasing, just to be completely clear on this, the new FBT exemption, that's huge because if you buy a conventional car now with a Novated Lease, you will be subject to some payment of fringe benefits tax because the vehicle is a fringe benefit to you and the fringe benefits tax is relatively small but significant, okay? If you buy a mainstream EV with a Novated Lease, you're not going to pay that fringe benefits tax at all. Big fat zero, dude. Makes a huge difference to the bottom line. So that's benefit number one. And benefit number two is you don't pay the GST on the vehicle, okay? So let's say you're buying a vehicle for making the numbers easy, $66,000. If that's the price of the vehicle, then the GST is like six grand, okay? That means if you go for the salary sacrifice, the cost of the vehicle is $60,000. If you finance it out of your post-tax salary, just use some other kind of loan, then you're gonna have to borrow $66,000. There's no way that I can see, that I'm aware of, for an employee to get out of paying the GST on a new car without being in a salary sacrifice arrangement. It's a remarkably good deal, okay? So it lowers your taxable income like we discussed and it means that some of the money that we all begrudgingly pay to the government for taxation can be translated into a tangible asset in your driveway. And I know taxation is not just a grudge thing because it does provide healthcare and roads and law and order and things that we do actually value in society, but none of us jumps out of bed and riffs air guitar at the prospect of paying even more tax. Am I right? Okay, so it lowers your taxable income, which is a positive thing, and you get a vehicle in your driveway in exchange, which is even more positive. And the final benefit I'd suggest is to your employer, because if you're an employer and you want to keep valuable employees on side, you often have to incentivize them in some way. And these incentives can be very expensive. You can be flying them here and there and doing competitions and providing prizes and whatever. This kind of stuff is a bit transient, but it's also expensive, right? A novated lease is a benefit to the employee and it doesn't cost you anything because as the employer, all you've got to do is set up a payroll deduction and sign a couple of forms because the financier does the heavy lifting, right? They're going to do all the paperwork, the compliance, they're going to source the vehicle. And if the employee leaves your employee, the novated lease goes with them to their next job. You're not left with some dodgy car that nobody else in the world wants in the office car park. It's the employee's car slash problem, okay? So that's a huge benefit. And incidentally, the reason as an employee you don't pay the GST is because the finance company technically is leasing you the car. So they procure the car and it's a cost of doing business to them. Therefore, they claim the GST on their bass. And that means they don't have to pass the GST on to you because they're not paying it, right? That's how this works. Now, although they are technically leasing you the car, it's your car. And there's a residual that you can pay at the end if you want to hang on to it. Or you can give it back and go again at the end of the term. It, it really is quite flexible like that. And it depends whatever the contract says. But if you don't have a novated leasing process at work, what I'm saying is it's pretty easy to set one up. And I can't imagine too many objections flowing from your employer. In fact, with this new legislation, I can see a whole new class of employer who wants to get on board with this by offering the green vehicles to their employees because Every second business on the planet wants to green up their image. And this is a fantastic way of doing it that essentially costs the employer virtually nothing. So look, if you want to know more about that, you can contact the dudes at novatedleaseaustralia.com.au. I don't have any sort of ongoing relationship with them. I just trust them because I've known the boss for such a long time and uh, their senior consultants there. I've known them for a long time as well since I've started doing this particular business 
And I just suggest that this is going to cause uh, an absolute <laughs> an absolute avalanche of demand for EVs because there are all kinds of barriers to entry into all kinds of different things. But the one significant barrier to EV ownership is the price. It's been prohibitive for some time. Like a Kona, like a fully loaded Kona is what, 40 grand or 50 grand or something. The fully loaded Kona EV is like 50% more. This is a huge additional impost to ordinary people. Like if you are the CEO of Rio Tinto or something, the cost of the car doesn't matter because you've probably got five or six different cars, whatever you want, right? But if you're a mum or a dad on a salary, $25,000 extra for a car, which is kind of the ballpark we're talking about, that's hugely significant. And what the Albanese government has essentially done with this Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill 2022, what a mouthful, is reduce that barrier to zero for a great many ordinary Aussies. And if you're one of them, you've been sitting on the fence, now's the time, dude.